Last week, if you recall, uh, and welcome if you're online as well. I know we've been getting quite some engagement actually online. I had a message through the YouTube channel through the week that uh, last week there was a young lady online, Sharon, if you're there, God bless you. Um, she had a complete healing of her knees. She knelt, knelt down to thank the Lord for what was going on. When she stood up, they were completely healed. I don't know if you remember last week, but there was lots of knee things going on. So there's, there's stuff happening out there and there's stuff happening in here and it's all good. But last week we looked at Elijah and I'm just going to prod your memories a bit if you haven't caught up with that. Elijah exemplified the life of a prophet. He was my hero in terms of Old Testament prophets, probably because he was so active in foretelling the Messiah and uh, bringing the revelation of the Messiah who was to come in incredible detail. In fact, to the extent that Isaiah 53 is commonly called the fifth gospel. If you haven't read that, you need to read it because it is incredible writing that took place 400 years before the, the coming of Jesus. So Elijah exemplified the Old Testament prophet, um, but the most beneficial takeaway from his life, in my opinion, is that Elijah was also an amazing overcomer. And as with many of these guys from the Old Testament, uh, their lives were a foretaste of what we can have. So he was an overcomer, and through Jesus, our job is to overcome, obviously. I said overcomers ultimately defeat their opponents against the odds and often steal victory from the jaws of defeat. Circumstances don't inform the overcomer's ability to persevere. In fact, sometimes circumstances will spur on an overcomer and they'll get more and more determined to finish the race. If you look at Elijah, he was that kind of guy. His reaction, or his interaction, I should say, with Ahab and Jezebel illustrate that point very well. What we see in Elijah is that he was a human being first. And so he had natural fears. He feared Jezebel because she was a mean woman. She was like, she was wired. She was on steroids. She was evil. And so he had a natural fear of her. But then when the anointing of God came on him, he was fearless. And he kept going back to Ahab and uh, bringing God's pronouncement upon him. So that was a pretty brave thing. And you know what? God's calling brave people to stand up today as well. But this morning, what I'd like to do, and I've been looking forward to this. I've never preached on Ruth before, I don't think. I don't recall ever doing that. But we're going to take a look at her life. And there's this one little book in the Old Testament called Ruth. If you haven't read it, jump into it and spend a week on it. Seriously. There is so much in this book. And it's a story. Ruth's story is a story of redemption. Now, when I say story, often we think of fiction and we equate stories with fiction. This is a true story. This is the story of a young Moabite woman. And she's an amazing woman. It's a small book, but it's an important book and it's in the very first part of the Old Testament, buried in amongst the judges. So it's in that period of history around 1000 BC where the judges were speaking to Israel and bringing God's verdict against them in many cases. So this morning we're going to look at this. The best definition that I could think of for redemption, and if you go to your dictionary, you'll get probably four or five bullet points, but the best definition of redemption, I think, is this. It's the act of purchasing something previously sold. So I want you to keep that in mind throughout this morning. The act of purchasing something that's been sold, repurchasing it back. Since the fall of humanity, and again, this is a history lesson, in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve sold the entire human race into bondage to Satan, the manifestation of God's plan of redemption has been unfolding. From the very moment that humanity sinned, God had his, in his heart to redeem us, to buy us back. Where we were sold, 
into slavery to Satan, God has been working to move every one of us back into his kingdom. Now that's a mammoth task. And again, the Old Testament's full of it if we've got eyes to see this. Redemptive history has built up the thousands of years of elapsed Old Testament years. And, and it's culminated in Jesus, the Christ, the only begotten Son of God. That's the message of the gospel. In doing so, Christ brought back or redeemed us from Satan's hold. That's the story of salvation. Again, it's a true story. And the New Testament fills out the continuing narrative of our salvation. So we shouldn't separate the Gospels from the writings of Paul or anyone else. This is one continuous story. It started in Genesis and it will end in Revelation. And the, the New Testament teaches that we are growing in our salvation as we press into Jesus. We're growing in our salvation. So the whole Bible is a narrative of redemption, of us coming back to God and not being able to do that without him, obviously. John chapter 1 and verse 11, John says this, he says, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Now he's referring to Israel. He came to his own people, but his own people rejected him, obviously. Verse 12, then it says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. I love that passage because it summarizes the act of redemption very well. You see, the natural children of God are the people of Israel. And the Old Testament is their story. It's a story of coming to God after the fall. And so what is going on in Jesus is that he came so that all could come to Christ. Now this was an act that went beyond Israel. It went to people like you and I, the Greeks and the Gentiles and the Aussies. It's a story of redemption. And as we look at Ruth's life, what we see is that her life was a prophetic foretaste of God's heart for everyone who's outside God's family. So this morning, if you're in the house, if you're online, I want to remind you that no matter what your situation is, no matter what you've done, no matter what your background is, God is for you. He's calling you back to his kingdom. And the story of redemption applies to you as much as it did to Ruth the Moabite. Now the Moabites, interesting, we're going to get to this in a minute, but incredibly, these people in today's world would be the Gentiles. She was a woman outside the family of God. And what we see in her is this amazing story of redemption. We're not going to be able to cover enough of it this morning. And under normal circumstances, I'd probably spend three or four weeks in this book. It deserves more than one morning, but that's what we're going to do this time through anyway. Before we jump right into this, I want to just give us a little bit of background into Ruth because I think that's necessary. So this book of Ruth was written around the time, as I said, the Old Testament judges, and we can probably date it somewhere between 1350 BC and around 1050 BC. So it's just before the prophets. Ruth was a Moabite. The Moabites and the Ammonites were both descendants of Lot. Remember Lot, who couldn't look back, otherwise he'd turn into a pillar of uh, salt. And so the beginning of these tribes, uh, as with most of many of the descendants that weren't of Israel, wasn't very palatable. You look at the beginning of the tribe of Moab, and it's not a great start to, to the world. Uh, they were enemies of God, full stop. They were people who were outside God's favour, and in many ways, Ruth was in that situation. When I look at Ruth, I see us in her. You see, the gospel says that we were outside Christ. We were enemies of God, and he purchased us at a great price. Ruth exemplifies that, that story. In Genesis 19, and I want to just pick up a little bit of her background to give you an idea of where the Moabites sat in terms of God's economy. 
Genesis 19, verse 30. This is kind of R-rated, guys, so you've got to be, if you're in the room, hopefully you're an adult. It says this, Lot and his two daughters left Zor and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zor. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old and there is no man around here to lie with us, as is the custom all over the earth. Let's go, let's get our father to drink wine and then lie with him and preserve our family line through our father. Very culturally wrong in our day and age, obviously, and pretty damn wrong back then as well. Verse three, uh, 33. That night they got their father to drink wine and the older daughter went in and lay with him. He was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, the older daughter said to the younger, Last night I lay with my father. Let's go get him to drink wine again tonight. And you go in and lie with him so that we can preserve our family line through our father. Verse 35, so they they got their father to drink wine that night also. And the younger daughter went in and lay with him. Again, he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son and she named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites today. The younger daughter also had a son and she named him Ben-Ami. And he is the father of the Ammonites of today. So this is a very, this is the kind of story that when you go searching in your family tree on Ancestry.com, you don't want to find it. This is the worst case scenario, let me tell you. The Moabites were definitely enemies of Israel. They'd broken every law in the Old Testament covenant. Deuteronomy 23, here's one example. Verse 3, No Ammonite or Moabite or any of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord even down to the tenth generation. So the sin committed right at the beginning of the birth of this tribe was enough to keep them separated from God for 10 generations. They were hated by God. And that, I mean, that's a, that's a harsh thing to say. But the, the act was abhorrent to him. And there are many ways we can learn about God's plan of redemption when we look at what happened to Ruth because she descended from the Moabites. And we're looking at less than 10 generations. Ruth's life shows us that no one is beyond the reach of God and his incredibly amazing grace. That's the story we get from Ruth. So there's a little bit of background. And here in Ruth 1 and from the verse 1, it says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. Elimelech. His wife's name, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion. They were Ephathrathites. And if you say that really quickly, you'll be speaking in tongues. From Bethlehem and Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth, after they had lived there for about 10 years. Both Marlon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her sons and her husband. So here's Naomi stranded in the land that God hates, in the land of the Moabites, She's with her. She has two daughter-in-laws, both Moabites. Her sons have been taken out. Her husband's been taken out. And she's stuck there alone. You see, it's what happens after this that shows us what is possible when we're prepared to lose everything and pursue God. Because this story is as much a story about Naomi as it is about Ruth. You see, Naomi came from Israel. She was a favoured person. She was part of God's family. Ruth was an outsider. She was a foreigner. She'd come from the tribe of the Moabs. 
of the Moabites. And what we see in Ruth is an incredible young woman. She's a woman who, I believe, pursued God. And the story, as it unfolds, shows us so. You see, people often pursue God when they see his hand on someone else. And in the case of Ruth, she watched Naomi, her mother-in-law. She must have seen in Naomi an incredible woman, a woman who followed God, a woman who tagged along with her husband and went to the land that she didn't probably want to go. And through circumstances, they put down roots, they married into the land, and she ended up with these two daughter-in-laws. Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, must have been a woman who displayed God's favour. Again, this is a story for us. You see, as God's people, what we do and what we say, people out there listen and look at. And if we do things well, ultimately we set this kind of situation up. Let's pick it up in verse 6. It says, When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughter-in-laws prepared to return home from there. With her two daughter-in-laws, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your, to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud and, she, and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye and Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. And then verse 16, But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. This is the famous verse in Ruth. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Now, Ruth didn't say that at a whim. You see, there'd been a whole heap of stuff going on in the background where Ruth and Naomi had connected, they'd attached. There'd been a connection that took place that was more than a mother-in-law can experience with a daughter-in-law. I believe Ruth looked at Naomi and saw in her something that she lacked. And so Naomi chose to return to Bethlehem in Judah and took her Gentile daughter-in-law with her. By the way, did you know that Orpah, uh, Oprah Winfrey was named after her? They actually spelt her name wrong on the birth certificate. Just a bit of trivia, there you go. It probably explains she's a bit of a Moabite. <laughs> I'm sure when Naomi returned to Bethlehem, it was an embarrassment for her. In the context, when you think about Old Testament Hebrew culture, Here's Naomi returning to the land of her forefathers back into Judah with a Moabite girl who her son had married. So there were multiple laws that had been broken in the process. Firstly, there'd been the breaking of the law because her son married outside of Judah and Israel. And secondly, she brought this unclean woman back to Judah. So she returned to Bethlehem, she brought her daughter-in-law with her and she suffered the embarrassment that would then follow. You can see the shame in Naomi's experience as they arrived in Bethlehem. Here it is in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 19. And it says, So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. 
And the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, by the way, which means pleasant. It means some, something very pleasant, Naomi. She told them, Call me Mara. And again, that word Mara means bitter. Because the Lord has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me pleasant? Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabitess. Note that it inserts her whole title there because of the shame that came with it. Her daughter-in-law arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. So here's Naomi, cringing and creeping back home. She's the typical case of the prodigal son, coming back and bringing all the shame with her, bringing her daughter-in-law with her. On the other hand, in Ruth, what we see is a woman who saw something in Naomi that she wanted. She'd connected with her, she had become dependent on her, and she saw something in Naomi that was far more attractive than going back to Moab and finding another husband. And so Ruth really set out to pursue God. And then what we see on the other hand is that God also set out to pursue Ruth. You see, I often think about this. I know that in this room we have a diversity of opinion in this room and I love that about our church. No wonder the th theology of salvation is so confusing. Here what we see is both classic Calvinism or the fatalistic predestination of God going after Naomi, uh, Ruth and bringing her into the kingdom as if she was always destined to do that. And on the other hand, we also see classic Arminianism, Arminianism or the free will of choice where Naomi pursues and comes to Naomi, and uh, sorry, where Ruth pursues Naomi and says, I'm going with you. Your God will be my God. And so we see both those things happening all at once. And we always come up wanting when we try and make a choice between man-made systems of theology. Now I have a leaning in that equation. I think some of you know where I sit. But Guys, we mustn't be dogmatic in human theology because I think what we see in God is that he signed up for both those systems to some extent. In fact, they probably did come from him, but we only hear in mono. We often don't hear in stereo when we're listening to God. And so we often come up wanting and we often don't see the many facets and paradoxes that take place in the kingdom of God. You see, a paradox consists of two truths that seem to be opposing. And yet what we see in God, who is truth, that he can hold these things in tension. If he gave us all the knowledge of salvation, our head would probably explode. We wouldn't be able to hold it. And so we develop systems that are two-dimensional. That's just a freebie, by the way. You can have that and take it away. Let's pick it up again here in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 1. Remember, God pursued Ruth. It says this, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Let me go back to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favour. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. Verse 3, So she went out and began to glean the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, the Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, whose young woman is that? She caught his eye. Now this is, we have to understand a little bit about the Hebrew culture and, and the law. And I'm not going to give us a lesson on that this morning. Again, get into Ruth, check out the law, check out that I'm not telling you lies. 
But the bottom line is, when a woman lost her husband, it was the responsibility of the nearest relative of the husband to then care for that woman. And so what we see here in Boaz is that there's a distant relationship through the, through the bloodline. There's a distant relationship. But there was a man with a closer relationship to Ruth, a relative of her husband. And in the law, this person was called the kinsman redeemer. Kinsman meaning family. So his job was to redeem the relationship. He was the kinsman redeemer. Remember what redeem means? To buy someone back or to buy something back that's previously been sold. So the kinsman redeemer would then look after the widow and would most likely marry her and care for her. But what took place here is that Boaz caught sight of Ruth and something happened, the chemistry started to happen. None of you guys in the room know what I'm talking about. And after a bit of horse trading, Boaz ultimately assumed all the duties and responsibilities of the kinsman redeemer. In other words, he met with the relative and they sorted out a deal. This allowed Boaz the responsibility to act on behalf of Ruth's deceased husband. So that's basic. Now, we've got to be very careful with biblical culture, particularly Old Testament culture, that we don't translate it to the 21st century. We neither live out of that culture nor do we cancel it. Hello? It happened. It's real. We don't cancel culture, do we? I know that people want to do that today, but we're not going to do it here. And so the, this man had the responsibility now of caring for Ruth, and in fact, it didn't seem like too much of a burden to him. He seemed quite happy about the whole prospect. So this was a set-up job. And I go back to what I said just a while ago. This was ultimately God pursuing Ruth. He set the situation up. He was after her. And again, you can see I'm becoming more reformed again in my theology. He brought her into the fold of his chosen people because he went after her and made it impossible for her to resist him. Ultimately, Boaz would marry Ruth and her, her redemption would be complete. That's the way the story unfolds. And it always has a, has a New Testament uh, reflection as well. Again, in verse uh, chapter 4 and verse 9, it says, Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought Naomi. There's that word, redemption. She was bought back. So that's the correct word. I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elil. Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I also have acquired Ruth. That's a good, good way to put it, isn't it? I've acquired my wife. <laughs> I've acquired Ruth the Moabites, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or the town records. Now, this is very Old Testament cultural, and it comes directly from the law. Today, you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathath and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the, offspring, through the offspring the Lord gives you, and by this young woman may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. And so they're rating Ruth in very high regard here. Verse 13, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Now this is an amazing story. It has incredible connection to the New Testament. It shows us what salvation looks like in the 21st century. If we understand the culture, if we understand what's going on, where Ruth had come from and where she ended up. In the New Testament, Jesus, as we know, is regarded as an example of a kinsman redeemer. 
He's one who is buying back the people outside of the tribe of Israel and bringing us into the kingdom of God. He also redeems us because of our great need. And he's the only one that can satisfy that need. Ruth chapter 3 and verse 9, we see here that Ruth was needy. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. She's speaking to Boaz. You see, what we see here is a beautiful picture of a needy sinner seeking forgiveness. Unable to rescue herself, the kinsman redeemer has to cover her with his cloak. Just as we need the covering of Jesus and the protection of Christ to redeem her and to make her his wife. You see, this helps us understand the church as well. When we think about the church, we speak, and I love the way, um, Alana, you referred to the church this morning as her, because that's what we are. We are the bride of Christ. We are in the same kind of mold as Ruth. We've been redeemed. Christ has brought us back from all kinds of backgrounds, even if we have had a Jewish background. As when we look at Ruth, there is a connection right back, but it got missed. And so we see this incredibly beautiful picture. In the same way, the Lord Jesus Christ brought us for himself out of the curse and out of our destitution. And if you don't think you were in that place, then you need to re-examine whether you're actually saved or not. Because every one of us has come from a place of destruction and destitution. He made us his own beloved bride. It's, a, it's just a great picture of the New Testament. You see, Jesus is the true kinsman redeemer. And he's the one who has, God has sent to redeem the earth. In Revelation, and I'm going to finish up with this scripture, Revelation 9 and verse 7, the revelator says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. So that same picture of the bride coming to the bridegroom in the book of Revelation is seen right there back in the book of Ruth. And it's a narrative that goes through the Old Testament. Um, many of the stories have that kind of meaning on them. They're true accounts. And you see that there's this incredible connection between the Old Testament Jewish tradition and what Jesus Christ did at the cross. It's one story. Remember, we say that always. We're not an Old Testament people. We're not a New Testament people. The Bible is Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. You see, we are the bride and we've been redeemed as enemies of God. We've been bought out of bondage and we're now with him. We were enemies of God and now we are part of his bride of his, and we belong in his glorious, incredible grace. What an amazing story, don't you reckon?